September 1972. Whispering Bill, someone who's dying from throat cancer, agrees to cooperate with authorities and show them the Hells Angels burial ground. It was a time of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. LSD, methamphetamine, living the life, hardcore, going to that edge and jumping over. That's the way it was back then. Totally different than it is now. Them guys partied upon party. They go forever. It was also a hard time. One where law enforcement was starting to really take aim at motorcycle clubs. Especially the big name 1% clubs. The Hells Angels Burial Ground. What is it? Well, in 1972, a guy that went by Whispering Bill had terminal throat cancer. And he wanted to spend the rest of his days free. So he decided to turn on his brothers, become an informant, and show them where some bodies were buried up in California. Let's take a look. September 1972. Whole year before I was born. Whew, I'm feeling old now. Uh, he was suffering from throat cancer again, like I said. He was in the Alameda County Jail in Oakland on a various uh, state and federal charges. He offered the cops the information on a burial ground where the Hells Angels, Oakland, buried a couple people from an incident that happened. He got immunity, the charges were dropped, and he took them to a ranch owned by a former Hells Angels uh, chapter vice president, George Baby Huey Wethren and his wife Helen. They discovered the bodies of two club prospects, Charlie uh, Baker and uh, Big Tom Shell, and an unidentified woman in abandoned wells on October 30th and November 1st of 72. They've been beaten and strangled to death by Piper and other members of the club's Richmond chapter. Let's stop there. It's funny that they gave him an immunity, especially when he was behind the death. Go figure, right? And this happened, he claimed... Why was at a party and something got spiked with LSD. And this was January 15th, 1971. Now, LSD was pretty rampant back in that time. Again, it was a time of love, sex, rock and roll, you name it. Uh, <laughs> man, what it would have been like to live back then. Whew, they knew how to party. Now, there was a woman killed by a gunshot to the head. And LSD really does this type of stuff to you, man. It makes you paranoid. Uh, you're either going to have a good trip or you're going to have a bad trip. Most of the time, depending on what it is, the strength, you're going to have a bad trip. Uh, it, I guess it all goes by attitude. See, I haven't done any of that stuff since early high school. I'm a 420 guy. I don't go over that, but that's what I heard. Now, Weathern and the wife were charged with drugs and stolen uh, property possessions. Involved were four other angels, Edward Jr. Carter, Chester Festus, uh, William Mark Zorro Minnan and William John Moran, which we do have some of his case that you guys can look at. Again, I'll put this material in the description box. 
they were charged with murder and accessory. Weathering became a governor, uh, government witness as well, and all charges were dropped against him and his wife. That's what they do when they give out immunity. Don't matter, like Sammy the Bull, man, uh, on confession, 19 murders. But because they wanted John Gotti so bad, they wiped that out. Wiped it out. But while in protective custody, uh, November 7th of 72, uh, he, he attempted to blind himself by gouging pencils into his eyes and attempting to strangle his wife. I think there was a screw loose there, don't you guys? Yes, I do. Uh, Moran was convicted of murder of Baker and acquitted on the Shoals murder on April 5th of 73. Uh, the original guy who started at Pfeiffer or Whispering Bill, he died after the first few days of the trial, uh, during which uh, Green testified for the prosecution. Uh, Richmond chapter president, Rodden, so it's Richmond, my bad with Oakland, my bad, correction. Uh, Rodden Richard Allen was convicted of first degree murder and involuntary manslaughter in the deaths of Baker and Shaw. Rock on, ouch. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's take a look at who George Weathern was again. This is from OnePercenterBikers.com. Uh, the bodies were left in an abandoned well on the property. He wasn't suspected of being part of the murders, but because the property was in his name and he was hiding the stuff out, they were going to charge him with accessory, it looks like. Uh Let's see here. He left the keys to, of the ranch to William Minnan and was told not to be at the property at a designated weekend. Uh, a raid uh, on the ranch where drugs and weapons were found. Back then, that was something normal. They had it all over the place. Unlike today. It's not like today, guys. And that's something that you got to understand uh, from a younger generation uh, aspect is some of this history that we're, you know, going over, it was tenfold of what you'd ever see today, man. These guys lived the life. These one percenters, they lived it, breathed it, and they died for it. Now, there are some exceptions where you had guys that would rat on each other. Not as much as today, but, you know, let's be honest, it happened. And that's one thing I never understood. Never understood. If you're going to get into a game, you know the risks. You want to get the reputation from the game. Then you need to learn how to accept what's coming to you. If you get hemmed up in something like this, why... Would you turn informant? I guess dude uh, was dying. Maybe he wanted to make his peace. I don't know. But it always seems when something bad goes down, everybody's the first one to stand up, raise their hand, and want to cut a deal for immunity. And that is not brotherhood. You're supposed to stand with your brothers bleed with them, cry with them, and if necessary, share time with them in the joint. Because that's the game that you chose. Now, there is a book out there, Wayward Angel, the full story of the Hell's Angels. It was written by George Wethren and Vincent Colnett, uh, it gives an insight into his life, joining the Hells Angels, finally turning state witnesses. He is still, I believe, I don't know if he's dead, but they do mention that witness protection. 
here's some of the stuff is, uh, and if you ever want to look up these kind of cases, you go to Justia. It's a law type of deal. It has all the appeals, the whole nine yards in this deal. So you can always look this up. Now, after a business meeting, I'm just going to skim. Again, you guys got to look at this stuff yourself. I'm just bringing it to you. You guys look into the incident. Uh, Barker decided to throw a party and supplied cocaine, which was snorted through a rolled up $100 bill. Other drugs uh, were also in use. Shoal and Baker were sent out for beer and whiskey. Barker and Green slipped about 10 LSD tablets into, damn, 10? Shoo! His coffee and similar number into Baker's beer. Uh, Six o'clock the following morning, he became hysterical and paranoid. Everyone began playing games with his mind. It Suffice to say, they were partying hard back then. Uh, slipping a prospect. See, prospecting back then was a lot different than it is now. It was some hardcore stuff back then. There's a saying now, don't ask a prospect to do something that you're not willing to do yourself. And that came from this kind of mentality back then. Uh... Now, he was a hysterical shawl, and they were kind of screwing with his mind, bad trip type of deal. Uh, he was provoked to violence. Barker ordered, grab that son of a bitch. Uh, defendants and others held shawl while Biker, our, uh, Barker telephone club member Spawn for second tablets to quiet shawl. Uh, the members attempted forced uh, tablets down his throat, but he spat them out. Anybody that knows anybody on LSD, not the best way to go, man. They were just trying to calm the guy down because he was losing his mind. And after that much, I don't... Yeah, holy cow, man. Uh, anyway, about 7.45, he saw Barker Summon Green, uh, who left the party five hours earlier... Uh, he entered a clubhouse. He saw Shoal screaming, hysterical, bleeding, struggling to remove his bonds. Uh, Green suggested that Shoal be taken to the hospital. He refused. A uh, few minutes later, Pfeiffer emerged from the bedroom and told Barker that Shoal was dead. Uh, now, Pfeiffer, or Pfeiffer, or whatever he's called, Whispering Bill, let's just go uh, by that. Uh, Barker pulled out his gun and instructed uh, him to kill Baker as we don't want no witnesses. So they went down that uh, road right there. And it, it's kind of uh, sad because they're the ones who did all this. They're the ones who started everything with this. They're the one who got everybody freaked out on the LSD and stuff like that. And this was the appeal on everything. And again, uh, Whisper and Bill and this other guy, they did it. So it is really something, let me tell you, of how all this went down. Again, you're going to want to see the whole case, read through this, and get a better understanding but again it was a lot different back then than it is now uh so hopefully these history type of deals and throwing these cases at you will better make you better understand the one percent lifestyle these ain't guys that are on the internet uh talking smack they're not trying to give you lessons. These are guys who lived the life 110%. And they didn't play. And this is the reputation that a lot of the clubs enjoy today is from the guys back then. So when you see an old gray beard, walk your butt up to him and shake his hand and ask him about some stories, man. They'll tell you all kinds of stories. Anyway, I'm going to go over to the radio station right now. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the video. Share it if you could. You can all, uh, hear the second part of the show on InsaneVoltageRadio.com or you can go over to the Discord channel. I'll see you guys over there. <laughs>